Okay, the day has arrived, and it's kind of crazy, but it's our last class period today. Until the final, right? I'm not sure how to take that as a class but <laughs> that means you made it. Congratulations. Let's give yourself a round of applause. All right, so we have two lectures left. That's it. We have the final. Gabrielle, you look ready with your highlighters, like just like quick draw highlighter right there. That's pretty cool. Um, you guys like the weather? Are you like me? Does the, does the snow make you happy? So I kind of close this because it gets cold from the front door opening. <coughs> so that way less cold air wiggles in. If you guys get really chilly, I would suggest either you move up a little, because this is just the pathway of cold air right here. Okay. All right. So we have liver and then we have cardiovascular. You have respiratory that some of you have already tackled it. I've, I've seen that pre quizzes, even post quizzes, are done on respiratory. Um, so I shortened liver and cardiovascular. I don't know if you guys saw that kind of at the 11th hour. I was going through it and saying, I am not known to be brief, so I better cut out a piece line. Okay? <clears throat> so I think we should be good for today, getting through these two topics. Again, if there's anything that we don't cover, we won't be on for, for the final. Let's talk about the final a little bit. So, uh, multiple choice, or multiple guess, however you prefer to look at it, based on the last uh, average, I don't think it's a guessing game. You guys are doing really well. I would anticipate the class average to be about the same as it was in the second exam, or maybe a point or two higher. That's the trend, that's how it usually works. Um, you guys are following the trend, you're just on a slightly higher trend, which just says some positive things about you guys. So next Wednesday, not Monday. Here's the good news. If you show up in this class on Monday at 1230, ready to take the final, um, you will be very prepared because the final is not until Wednesday, okay? So Wednesday, 1230 in this room, similar as before. It's a two hour final, just like all the other exams. Probably 20 to 30% review, 20 to 30% review. If you were comfortable with the review questions last time and, and the, the way that I've been asking in class you should be fine. Does it make sense to study a ton on all the old content? Probably not. If there's a concept that you don't really, you never really understood, maybe now's the time to, to, to get it down. But again, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't stress about the old content. I don't pull questions intentionally from pre and post quizzes. You probably have seen that. Um, could there be similar types of questions that show up? Yeah, but it's not like intentional where I go to the question bank and I try to pull an old question, whether it's a quiz question, pre or post, or whether it's an old exam question. I'll be in my office hours. I had a uh, grad student that's done this morning, so I couldn't make office hours. But next week, my office hours will be two, two hours long. So if you if you do have a final, um, hopefully it's either before or after that, okay? Um, and if you really need some time beyond that, email me and we'll try to squeeze in a custom time slot before the final, okay? Any other questions before you go on? Format questions? The last thing is, there the reviews for this class are open, so if you haven't done so, I'd really appreciate if you guys would feedback about the class. So let me explain this to you. Um, I read every single one of the student feedback comments, even the silly ones, okay? Some of you, some of you are funny. Um, I, there's no way for me to find out who they are from. And we don't get them until next semester. So your grades are already in, so you're completely anonymous and your grade is safe. Um, if you really like the class, don't just say, hey, best class ever. Tell me why. Okay? It's, it's actually more helpful to understand why you liked it. The flip side, if you didn't like the class, instead of just saying the class sucked, Give me some examples of what you didn't like, okay? Um, we will try to, our, you know, some of the things are, you know, I've had comments like, hey, the class is awesome, it'd be better if there were no exams. <laughs> yeah, the, the life would be better if there were no traffic tickets, but 
Um, sometimes it's not possible to make those adjustments. Do you understand what I mean? But some of you really come up with some good suggestions, like, for example, SI, and that came from student feedback, right? Okay, here we go. What did one elevator say to the other? I think I'm coming down with something. <laughs> Why are parallel lines so lonely? Why are they never meet, nicely done. Okay, how about this one? What do you call a person who doesn't toot in public? Doesn't toot in public. A private tutor. Huh? A private tutor. Very good. All right. You guys are ready for the exam? I can see. Okay. okay. So on our overview for, for liver, we're going to talk about a couple of terms. Um, Review and this. If you didn't download the new, if you didn't download the new, I think that's danger. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's not coming. It's not coming. If you didn't download the new lecture deck. Uh, it's fine. I just eliminated some slides. Okay, to make it more succinct. So if there's a slide that shows up on your printout that's not on the screen, just put an X through it and say not not testable material, okay? <coughs> um, if you're online right now, the, it's called Revise. It's the same name as it was before, it just says Revise in the title of the file, okay? So that's how you know. Um, so let's talk about some of these terms as we move into liver. And the liver is a very critical organ. And we're gonna simplify liver disease today. I'm, I'm really kind of giving away the whole thing. But we're going to basically talk about um, cirrhotic disease, okay? Um, we're going to talk about um, um, alcoholic hepatitis, okay? And um, we're going to move into the portion of liver disease that really is one of the big buckets of liver problems, and that's with alcohol abuse. Now, it's not the only disease or um, cause of liver disease, rather. Um, alcoholism or excessive alcohol abuse, but you know, kind of given the demographics in the room, we're in a college campus, um, it, it's pretty relevant, okay, to other students not in this class. I get it, but probably your roommates you can have this conversation. Um, hepatitis. There's a variety of different uh, viruses that are in the hepatitis family that cause similar types of problems with the liver as alcoholism, okay, or chronic alcohol abuse. People don't like the word alcoholism because they don't want to admit they're an alcoholic, but the bottom line is alcohol as a poison is detox detoxified by the liver, and if it doesn't happen quick enough, there's an intermediate that causes um, damage to liver cells, okay? Um, some medications actually can cause liver damage. The liver uh, filters and detoxifies the blood, <coughs> including your medications prescription medications or even over-the-counter medications. And so if you're taking too much of any kind of medication, whether it's recreational, whether it's prescription, or whether it's over-the-counter, um, you're asking your liver to work, okay? And so patients that maybe have some compromised liver function and are on high um, volumes or um, a high population of different types of pharmaceuticals, uh, whether they're recreational or whether they're prescription, um, you could be asking the liver to work harder than necessary. Okay, so first term known as bilirubin. So bilirubin is the yellow breakdown product of normal heme metabolism. So heme is the molecule that contains iron um, um, within the red blood cell. So the hemoglobin molecule, the heme group that contains the iron um, this is recycled, and as it's broken down and recycled, bilirubin is one of the byproducts. Jaundice is a terminology which is a yellow um, tint or a yellow hue to the eyes and the skin. Um, also um, uh, can be realized in any of the mucous membranes, and it is a result of abnormally high levels of um, bilirubin in the bloodstream, where it's not being excreted out quick enough, okay? 
jaundice. Now, some infants, those of you that have kids or know people that have kids, or you've seen them in the zoo, um, <laughs> Uh, jaundice is a disease that can affect a lot of newborn infants. And, and the reason for that is when, a, when an infant, when a, a fetus is premature and it, it's born early, the liver isn't online quite yet in full capacity. And so during that period of time where it's coming online, uh, the recycling of the red blood cells is not happening as efficiently. And so some of the uh, side effects can be jaundice in the skin and the eyes. Now, there's a light therapy that we can use that pediatricians take it home even, and you can put it over the crib of the sleeping infant, and after about a week or two, it will help to, with light therapy, that wavelength of light can help break down the heme that's in the bloodstream and allow for the infant to have its liver uh, become operational, and then it usually um, clears up, okay? Uh, jaundice is something that we see in patients that have um, not just a premature liver, but have compromised liver function. The problem is the light therapy is a bridge to when the liver comes online, and in a patient that's suffering from alcoholic hepatitis, the liver is derelict. It's not going to ever come back. Okay, okay. <clears throat> cholestasis. Uh, this is a visible uh, biliary pigment um, that's in the canuliculi and hepatocytes that shows up due to decreased bile flow. Okay, so, so the bile product um, that, that is being manufactured, if it's not flowing well through the liver and ultimately emptying into the small intestine or duodenum, uh, you can have it build up within that um, duct system in the canuliculi and um, it can, um, cause this cholestasis, right? So it causes a pausing or stasis, ceasing the flow of the bile. Uh, another term that I want to talk about is ascites, A-S-C-I-T-E-S. -E we'll get to it in a couple slides, ascites. But ascites is fluid accumulation that happens in the peritoneal cavity. And it's usually due to liver problems. And so we'll get there, but that's just another term I wanted to define. Um, portal hypertension is the disease that typically causes ascites. Portal hypertension. So the liver, if you recall back to 202, the liver circulation is a portal circulation. It's a venous circulation. And portal hypertension occurs when you get an awful lot of collagen deposited within that vascular network. And that leads to high blood pressure within the portal vein portal vein. So on the venous side of the blood flow to the liver, you get high blood pressure or hypertension. And that high blood pressure hypertension on the venous side of the circulation causes a lot of the fluid to not be reabsorbed into the manual network, but to stay out into the extracellular space. And that causes a lot of fluid in the peritoneal cavity. Okay? That's in the belly region. Coagulopathy. So the liver itself manufactures almost all of the coagulation factors, except for factor eight. That's the only one it doesn't make. And so if you have a patient that has liver disease, whether it's um, alcoholic hepatitis, okay, or whether it's cirrhosis of the liver, or whether it's um, like a hepatitis A, B, or C, or whether it's liver cancer, Okay, that's another example. You can have coagulopathies where you don't have appropriate blood clotting. You get patients that will have hemorrhaging or bleeding that occurs um, almost spontaneously. They bruise very easily because the liver itself makes the blood clotting proteins. And so if it's having problems, your blood won't clot appropriately, okay? Do you think, this is a review question, but um, and it's a pretty aggressive review question. I'm not sure I'd ask this question, but I just thought of it. Um, maybe a horrible test question, but it's a great one for the lecture. If a patient was wrestling with liver disease, do you think inflammatory processes, as they relate to the recruitment of monocytes out of the bloodstream, would be compromised? True or false? True. True. So that's pretty good that you guys are, are tracking with me, okay? I was just thinking about that. 
kind of relate it back to inflammation. Okay, so because the liver makes the coagulation proteins, except for factor eight, all of them except for factor eight, 11 out of the 12, controlled blood clotting is important for the recruitment of these monocytes, right? The margination, where you slow down the blood flow so you can recruit these monocytes out and they become the tissue macrophages. So if that's compromised, you may not have appropriate inflammatory processes in place. Okay, last one, hypoalbuminemia, right? So albumin, albumin is synthesized and made by the liver. Albumin is the largest known protein in the bloodstream. It's huge. It's so big that it never leaves the vascular supply. It never leaks out. Even when you have exudates, right, transudates and then exudates, um, and you're allowing for fluid to leak out of the vasculature, albumin's so big it'll never leak out unless you have like a, a vascular lesion, like a cut or trauma, okay? But under normal physiologic conditions, albumin does not leave the blood flow. Why do you think that is? Why is it important that albumin stays in the bloodstream? Venous return, um, allow for venous uh, reabsorption of fluid. So if you have osmosis, the concept of osmosis where water is going to fall, you solutes, and albumin stays in the blood, a blood vessel, that maintains what we call colloid osmotic pressure. Right? We talked about this with exudates and transudates. So by having high concentration of albumin in the bloodstream, water is going to want to come into the bloodstream on the venous side of the circuit. So it allows for venous reabsorption of fluid, okay? So if you don't have albumin being made, you're hypoalbuminic, right? You lose a lot of fluid and it never returns back to the blood. Make sense? That's the role of albumin, okay? So we talked about the portal hypertension, high blood pressure on the portal side of the vasculature from the liver and this can lead to liver dysfunction where it stops making high amounts or appropriate amounts of albumin. And now you don't have fluid returning back into the bloodstream and then you end up with this situation known as ascites, A-S-C-I-T-E-S. -E so ascites is not a word that's on that slide except in the title, so you can probably circle that. Ascites is this fluid that accumulates in the peritoneal cavity because of portal hypertension, which leads to a compromised ability to make albumin and disrupts colloid osmotic pressure so you don't bring the fluid back in and it stays out in the extracellular space. Varices, these are distended veins and they often arise in this condition of ascites uh, because the veins are kind of starved of fluid. And so they're trying their best to recapture as much fluid as possible so they distend to the greatest extent possible. Now, the last one that says recall is back to kidney physiology. So if you have hypotension, right, you're going to release renin. So if the blood pressure is too low, which is what's going to result if you can't bring the fluid back in, right? You're going to trigger the kidneys to stimulate the renin angiotensin system to try to reabsorb as much water from the urine as possible so you don't lose your valuable water. But do you see how this is almost a positive feedback loop that makes it worse? Because if the problem is portal hypertension, and you shut down liver function so you don't make enough albumin, and now your blood pressure drops, and then you release renin to bring more fluid into the bloodstream, you're just gonna lose it again, you with me? And so this positive feedback loop, it says positive because it triggers it to keep going, not because it's valuable or beneficial, but it results in a situation like this. Okay, so this is um, ascites with a distended belly, and his patient's laying down. They're actually fairly thin. They're not, you know, middle-aged, overweight. They're thin individual. This is actually a chronic alcoholic, okay? This is their 
liver function is shutting down, so they're not making albumin, and they have a lot of fluid in their peritoneal cavity. And you can also appreciate the distended veins, right? You can see the varices of these distended veins on this particular patient. Now, this isn't the only situation where we see in a patient population that we've got um, ascites or compromised liver function that leads to a decrease in albumin production, which means that the fluid doesn't come back into the veins, it stays out into the extracellular space and kind of accumulates in the belly. We also see these in uh, extreme cases of starvation. Okay, so these kids are not wrestling with alcoholism. They're wrestling with starvation. And if you're like me, when you were young, and you would see these pictures like on the TV or you know, you'd see them in the magazines or trying to get you to donate, uh, I know this is gonna sound horrible, but this is a kid, you know, in my head I'm thinking, well, they're fat. They should have plenty to eat. What I don't understand. I'm like totally confused. Like I'm imagining like emaciated, you know, I didn't know what that word I wouldn't have used that word when I was a kid. But I mean skinny, skinny people are starving, right? Not these pot bellies, but let me explain the physiology. And nobody explained the physiology, you know, to, to a nine, ten year old, but I'm gonna explain it to you now so you could pass it on. So this is called Korshakov syndrome. Okay? K W A S H I O R K O R. K W A S H I O R K O R. So with Korshakov syndrome, because these kids have such low protein in their diet, they're actually starving, literally starving. Like we've, we've actually practiced in my house. You can say that you're famished and you're really hungry, but I don't like using the word starving. Yeah, I'm starving. Like, you don't use that word. Because actually those kids are really starving. Okay. So when kids are in a starvation mode, or adults, but kids tend to, because they're their low body weight and mass, um, they don't have a lot of reserves to begin with. So, it affects the children very quickly. But it's the same thing that's happening in these chronic alcoholics. They're literally starving their bodies, okay, the alcoholics. These children don't have enough protein in their diet, and so what ends up happening is um, the liver function is being compromised. They don't have enough fuel supply to keep the liver operational. Um, and so the liver is not making albumin enough and they have the same problem as a chronic alcoholic. They're hypoalbuminic. And the fluid just leaves the bloodstream and it collects in the peritoneal cavity. Where is the fluid being, where is it uh, in the cavity? Where is it in the cavity? It's in the tissues. It's sitting in the tissues, outside of the bloodstream, outside of the cell, the extracellular matrix. Yeah. Can it be reabsorbed? Yeah. Can, is this reversible? Yes. In the kids, yes. In a chronic alcoholic, after a transplant of the liver, maybe so. Okay, so let's talk about alcoholic liver disease. I wanna pause here, I'm picking on alcoholism. Again, kind of for a, you know, the audience that we have where, where you know, alcohol consumption is, is at its peak in this age group, in your age group, it's important to understand how this impacts the liver. But this is the same kind of processes that happen with trauma to the liver or liver cancer, okay? Or with hepatitis, okay? And again, hepatitis isn't just a sexually transmitted disease. Okay, everyone always, you know, oh my gosh, they had hepatitis, they were, they were sleeping with the wrong people, you know. Yes, it is transmitted sexually, it can be, okay? But you can contract it virally in other ways. Contaminated food, contaminated water, if it had fecal material that it was contaminated with, you can actually contract hepatitis A, okay? So I, I don't, part of education is to make sure you're giving good education so people can go out and propagate real information, right? And, and so one of your classmates just sent me a paper, I love this about this class, if I learned something new. I thought it was brand new, but it was like published 10 years ago. So it shows you how old I'm getting. Um, kind of talking about this linkage to uh, type two diabetes and Alzheimer's, which I had never heard. So you guys are educating me just as much as I'm trying to educate you, but. Again, I want to pause here and say that this is not just some of the effects of alcoholism. This can be hepatitis, A, B, or C. It can be liver cancer. It can be liver trauma. But essentially what we're going to look at is we're going to look at three different states of liver disease today. Alcoholic liver disease. And they're overlapping conditions. The first one we refer to as steatosis. 
We get a fatty change in the liver. We get a little bit of fibrosis, not much, but a little bit, around um, the venules. Then we see alcoholic hepatitis. Here we see some liver cell necrosis. We see inflammation, which makes sense. It's going in hand in hand with necrosis. We get structures known as malloy bodies, and we'll talk about those. And we get this fatty change that continues. And then the third category, and going in order of severity, the third category is cirrhosis, or a cirrhotic liver, which is what you always hear about, right? Cirrhotic liver. So cirrhotic liver, going back full circle to the beginning of the semester we talked about healing or wound healing. This is an example of the liver attempting to heal but not returning function. And so when you have a wound on the skin, what are some of the characteristics of, of the response, the wound healing that takes place with skin if you don't have complete wound resolution? You just get wound healing or repair. You get what? Scarring, thank you. You get fibrosis, which is another word for scarring. That's perfect. That's exactly what you see with liver cirrhosis or cirrhotic liver. Is you get a fibrotic scar. It is reversible or non-reversible? Non-reversible. Non Can you reverse the scar from your skateboard accident from last week? Right? No. Okay. So the scarring and the fibrosis is permanent damage, and this is the point of no return, where it cannot go back. So if you look at these arrows closely, you'll see, and I'll get you a question, you'll see that we have exposure and abstinence. You can kind of go back and forth between a normal, level, normal, normal liver and a steatotic liver, okay? Just to be a little crass, you know, Monday, Sunday, right? <laughs> back and forth. Um, same thing with alcoholic hepatitis. You got you know, more severe exposure and then abstinence. But when you have these repeated or continued exposures and you get down to the cirrhotic liver, there is not an arrow going back the other direction. Okay? Yes, sir. Uh, so if the cirrhosis is caught early on and it's just the piece that's like cirrhotic, can yeah. we cut that off and the, the liver will regenerate? Yeah, so you can have, you can have um, surgical resection of fibrotic liver, and the liver is actually a fairly impressive regenerative organ, and so it will, it will come back um, to some extent. But once it's fibrotic, it won't come back. So as long as you catch it early enough, you're absolutely correct. You can actually reverse the liver disease. It's, interestingly enough, um, so 90 days, right? Yeah, no. So when, when, you, when you talk with uh, alcoholic counseling, um, the abstinence trigger that they want for you psychologically is a 90-day abstinence from alcohol. That also corresponds physiologic to the ability to regenerate as much of your liver as possible. Okay, so from a... From a public service, we're, we're trying physiologically as well as psychologically to address problems with the liver and also the brain. The alcoholism is not really a liver problem, it's more of a psychological or a behavioral problem. Okay? So that 90 day mark is kind of interesting, right? A lot of times in the clinical community, they pick these targets for very specific reasons, right? Have you ever had four chambers, right? Four chambers? No, you're thinking the heart. No, the Lobes? Lobes, sorry. Uh, there's, go ahead, keep going. So when you're saying that you only need a quarter of the liver for it to regenerate, like if it doesn't regenerate with four, we just have three lobes to measure? Or? Yeah, so there's not four, there's only three, right? Three lobes of the liver, I believe. Four chambers in the heart, which is next lecture. Uh, so the lobes of the liver will um, regenerate to an extent, maybe not 100%, but they will keep their shape and their architecture. So you don't generate like, fourth and fifth lobe. Like you regenerate the lobes of the liver that are already there. So it would regrow into like, but if I take like a section of the liver yeah. so without the two other chambers, the lobes, right? Mm -hmm. does, it re does it regenerate the other lobes or does it still continue to be from the lobes of the liver? So the, the lobe itself will regenerate within its own lobe, but it won't spill out to a secondary lobe. 
So each lobe is responsible architecturally for its own regeneration. So when you transplant, do you make a transplant of all three lobes? Typically when they transplant, they'll do the whole organ. So they'll do the entire, they'll take the whole organ out and put it in the middle. So this is a continuum, right? There isn't some delineation or some line. And in addition to that, there's not really any great cutoff. So we describe with alcoholic use risk factors in a variety of different categories. So there is definitely a genetic component. Just like many types of uh, uh, psychological or mental uh, disorders, there is a genetic component. If it runs in the family, it's possible to show up in subsequent generations. We see that with mental illness, right? We see that with schizophrenia. We see that with obsessive compulsive disorders. We see that with lots of types of things. And alcoholism isn't really any different. It's a type of an addiction. Um, and that we've been able to identify that there is a familial history. Now, the other piece that's hard to understand is if there's a familiar history of genetics, is there also a familiar history of environment, okay? And so you tend to practice what you were taught. And so part of teaching is just modeling. You know? So if mom and dad are having uh, drinks with dinner, when you grow up, you're more likely to have drinks with dinner. If mom and dad were teetotalers, uh, meaning they don't drink any alcohol, you may not really you know, be interested in alcohol. So there is that sort of paradigm of genetics or nature versus nurture, right? But regardless of what side of the argument or the discussion you sit on of how much is nature and how much is nurture, there's definitely what we understand as being risk of use. Okay? And some of this is common sense. So generally speaking, the size of your liver is directly proportional to the size of the individual. So larger, taller, bigger massed individuals are gonna have larger livers, for sure. Women tend to have smaller livers than men because they tend to be smaller in mass. Um, risky use, as defined psychologically, is talking about anything over four drinks in one occasion, okay? They used to say day, but then people, what if I had like three before midnight and then four after, right? So that would be seven in one occasion, you with me? Okay. Um, on a regular basis, Okay, if it just happens on Friday or Saturday night, you usually put it in the category of binge drinking. But if it's, you know, I'm drinking every night four drinks with my meal, okay, but I'm having it with my meal, right? A bottle of wine is about four glasses. So if you have four glasses of wine with dinner every night, that's risky. So it's kind of common sense, like that's a lot of wine, man, you know? It's actually a pretty expensive um, habit too, if, if you like wine, okay, or good wine. I'm not talking about box wine, okay? Um, which is also a funny, I digress. There's a, there's a new Tide. You guys see this? There's a new Tide that's in a box dispenser. And the biggest criticism, I thought this was funny, the biggest criticism is people think it looks like box wine. I'm like, I don't have any box wine in my house, so maybe I didn't draw that conclusion. But to me, it looks like laundry detergent. So the other, the other metric here is um, you have low risk if you really avoid hangovers. If you do not feel, so what's a hangover, right? If you don't feel the effects the next day in any way, shape, or form, it probably wasn't risky drinking, okay? If you have a headache and you're puking, I think it's pretty obvious. If you're slower to get out of bed, okay? Um, you oversleep, you're kind of still feeling it a little bit, that was probably in the category of risk of use. So they say no hangover is a low risk, okay? So most individuals of drinking age can sit down, probably have a drink or two, and be not in the risky category. But one of the questions is, if you're having a drink or two seven days a week, is it becoming risky behavior? Well, now, you, now it's habitual, it's habit forming. And so if it's at two, it's very easy to go to three, and it's very easy to go to four, okay? All right. Um, the etiology of alcoholism really is excessive alcohol consumption that's on a regular basis, okay? Um, in counseling, 
if you're, you know, I get students asking, like, how do I know, if, you know, they won't raise their hand in here, but come into the office hours and send me an email from their friend's account, right? <laughs> how do I know if, if maybe there's a problem or not? So here's what a counselor will tell you. Um, stop drinking for how long to know if you have a problem? Huh? Jeez. You know, how long? 90 days. Stop drinking anything for 90 days. See how you feel. And if you have trouble doing it for 90 days, there's some level of a problem, right? I mean, abstinence was 90 days. It's a 90-day experiment. That's how you'll truly know. There's no home kit, okay? You can't really tell. But if, if it's hard for you and you have cravings or you have withdrawals in some capacity, there might be an issue there. So that's that's what a counselor will tell you, okay? Is an abstinence for 90 days. Less. It less the problem that we have, and I'm going to the problem we have is it causes damage to the architecture of the liver, the microtubules, the mitochondria, as well as the membrane fluidity itself. Um, so is alcohol dependence, is that a psychological issue or is it a physiological? I, I think the jury is in, in debate, but most would agree that there's some com component of both. Is there, you know, there's, because there's definitely a physiologic effect of alcohol. It relaxes. Right, that's a physiologic response. Um, but there's a psychological response too, where you kind of crave that relaxation or that buzz or, you know. Yeah. So there's a little bit of both. What is it? I don't know, 70, 30, 50, 50, 60, 40, I don't know. Okay. And it, it tends to be very you know, personal too. It tends to be very personal. Okay. All right, so moving on. This isn't a psychology or a counseling class. So I'm just trying to give you some tips that people have asked over the years um, that I found out because uh, students wanted to know. And so we go get answers. Um, what are the morphological differences between the three states? You know, if the point of no return is cirrhotic liver, what's the earlier phases? Well, steatosis, you get this cholestasis, right? So the cholestasis is where the bile cannot flow. So a lot of steatosis, um, you would know that you have a steatotic problem if the bile's not flowing. When you eat fatty foods, you're going to have a tummy ache, like painful. Okay, like sweet food. <laughs> so if if your tummy is overly sensitive to fatty, greasy foods, um, and you know that you have maybe some risky behavior, um, that's usually an uh, a, a sign of a cholestasis where the bile's not flowing. Alcoholic hepatitis, again, um, in order of severity, you get some hepatocyte swelling. There's some necrosis that shows up in the hepatocytes. You'll get malory bodies that form. Now, malory bodies are like an alcoholic hyaline. Um, these alcoholic uh, hyaline are um, <coughs> shown in this lower right picture. So here we've got normal liver histology with our three different zones away from the manual triad or the portal triad. Here you can kind of appreciate you've got swollen hepatocytes <coughs> that are kind of more plump and all of the pink cytoplasm is the hyaline. Okay. It's a hyaline-like cartilage that's deposited there and it's highly eosinophilic and it's made up of this hyaline cartilage and keratin filament protein. These are the malloy bodies. <clears throat> the last category of cirrhosis is you've got these micronodules. Um, you get a shrunken liver that is dying off. And it's non-fatty in architecture. So we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a moment. So if we look at each one of these, pathogenesis of steatosis. So one of the characteristics we said early on was you get some fatty change. So you can kind of appreciate in this histology that we're starting to see that normal histology in the lower or middle bottom picture here, the left image, that's normal. This is our fatty liver change. You can see all of these open spheres are vacuoles that are full of fat. And the reason for that is because of NADH. So if you look at this formula at the top, we've got um, 
alcohol plus NAD positive moves to an intermediate stage of acetaldehyde NADH, which moves to acetate. Now, <clears throat> the enzyme alcohol dehydrogenase is what catalyzes this, re this reaction that you see. And this is how your body detoxifies alcohol. It takes the alcohol, the ETOH, and it makes it into acetate, and then you excrete it. But you have this intermediate of acetaldehyde, and you have NADH, and you get a lot of extra hydrogen ion. Now, NADH inhibits lipolysis, the breakdown of fat, and it encourages lipogenesis, or the production of fat, and that's why the liver becomes fat, because you're consuming alcohol and its intermediate NADH upregulates lipogenesis. Now, this is reversible unless there's any fibrosis that shows up. We talked that there was a little bit of fibrosis that happens around the venules, so that won't go away, but anything else will actually disappear if the danger or the stimulant is removed. So the question that I kept in for this slide deck is, which of the following age groups is alcohol abuse the largest and the greatest? 15 to 17, 18 to 29, 30 to 54, 55, I kind of gave it away, but that's one of the reasons this lecture is kind of not down hepatitis. I mean, it's far less, it's far, it's it's still there, but it's far less common in this population, okay, than challenges with alcohol. All right, now let's look at alcoholic hepatitis. What are the what's the pathogenesis of alcoholic hepatitis? So that intermediate acetaldehyde, that's a hepatotoxin. All right, so go back to that formula. Acetaldehyde and NADH. Right, NADH, we talked about its effects here. Let's talk about acetaldehyde. That is actually hepatotoxin and it causes necrosis of the liver. <clears throat> when you get that necrotic response, you get inflammation. White blood cells get recruited. TNF-alpha is being released from Kupfer cells, K-U-P-P-F-E-R, and that causes hepatocyte damage. So a Kupfer cell is a special type of liver macrophage. We talked about a special type of <clears throat> macrophage in the brain, right, the microglia. The liver have specialized macrophages known as Kupfer cells. And they behave much like you would expect a macrophage. They show up and they release all sorts of cytokines and growth factors to try to stimulate cells to come in and help clean up the damage. And one of those factors they release is TNF-alpha. Then what happens next is you get these stellate cells. These stellate cells become activated and they stimulate a fibrotic response. So if you look at this picture here, this is a um, kind of a normal liver. Right here it is, normal liver. And then here's a fibrotic liver. And you can appreciate with these um, hepatocytes, and here's the bile uh, canuliculi right here with the yellow bile in it. Here is a stellate cell that's quiescent. Here's one of these macrophage-like cells, these Kupfer cells. And in a fibrotic response, you can kind of appreciate that this stellate cell is activated and it's making more fibrotic extracellular matrix. And that's where the fibrosis comes from, is from these stellate cells, okay? They're kind of like the liver fibroblasts. They make the extracellular matrix. And here, this is an activated a macrophage or an activated Kupfer cell who definitely has activity in stimulating these stellate cells to start making a fibrotic scar. Now, the upper right picture is just an enlarged image of one of the image that we saw earlier where you get more extensive malloy body formation. And you can see all the dark pink is your malloy body or your hyaline like eosinophilic containing material. Okay, last up is cirrhosis. If it progresses and you don't remove the injurious stimuli, uh, the patient continues to drink, okay, you'll end up with a cirrhotic liver where you get fibrosis from repeat stellate stimulation, like we saw on that previous slide. The macrophages or the Kupfer cells 
um, start making growth factors that cause this hypertrophy within the organ itself. You get repeat cycles of damage from alcohol, the ETOH, and then you kind of rearrange the architecture because you're having all this necrotic response with ensuing fibrosis, you end up with portal hypertension. And now we go back to the picture of that gentleman laying, right, on his back with his um, distended belly from ascites. This picture on the lower right, this histology, this is a um, histology stain where the fibrotic collagen is staining in this pink, and you can kind of appreciate all of the fibrotic scar in pink, whereas the purple surrounding it, uh, surrounding it, I wouldn't call it normal parenchymal tissue of the liver, but it's not the scarred portion, it's the non-scarred version. This is the outer gross surface. Do you remember when we looked last week at liver, and we talked about how if you have liver fibrosis, you're gonna have a bumpy, kind of orange peely surface. Same thing that you have here on the outside of the liver, okay? So, really, um, kind of just to summarize as we wrap up liver, three distinct diseases, but yet they're interrelated. We have kind of proposed that steatosis is level one, Alcoholic hepatitis is level two, and cirrhosis is level three, right? In order of severity. Now clinically, how are these patients going to manifest? Well, they'll have an enlarged liver under steatosis. Um, that's something that a lot of physicians can palpate, and we'll be able to tell you, so you can go see your doctor if you have questions about that. Elevated bilirubin levels, okay? So there is a blood test for that, not a home kit, but you can go see your doctor, they'll pull your blood and look at your ability to levels. If you look at alcoholic hepatitis, malaise, that just means you feel crummy, like the way you feel when you have the flu. You're gonna have a lower amount of energy, you're gonna feel um, yucky, is the scientific term, okay? Um, anorexia, severe weight loss in these patients. A lot of times they're choosing alcoholic calories, or calories from alcohol rather, um, over calories from other substances or other nutritional sources. And a lot of the calories found in a lot of alcoholic beverages are very empty calories. There's not much you can use there. If it's a sugary drink, they'll use the sugar, but that doesn't go very far, okay? They're not usually full of protein, not, you know, polyunsaturated fats. Um, they don't have a lot of vitamins, okay? Um, you're like, ah, oh, we're about to tell her my favorite drink is with vitamin water and um, the liver is usually tender with alcoholic hep hepatitis. So as the, as the uh, physician is palpating the abdomen and feeling the liver, it is tender to touch, it'll be painful. Um, high levels of bilirubin, high, high levels of bilirubin, and jaundice. And then we get over to alcoholic uh, cirrhosis, portal hypertension, ascites, peripheral edema, the feet will be swollen as well. Malaise continues, that's the bad feeling. Um, weight loss and severe jaundice, okay? Questions over liver. Shorter version of the lecture so that we can stay on task and get to cardiovascular, but there's no questions, let's take a break and then we'll come back and finish out our last and final lecture. How does that